Hey guys, how are you doing? It's Mick Tully. We're back. Without going into too much detail, there's been a very high profile case of a, basically a terrible abuse of power by instructors in the UK. That brought us all around to basically the topic of regulation in martial arts because any Tom, Dick or Harry can literally hire out a community hall and start teaching martial arts with literally nobody checking up on this. This isn't just teaching kids. This is teaching martial arts across the board. Okay, gotcha. So, Nathan, we're going to go straight to you. We've discussed this, but I really like your take on this. Can you share it with the guys who are watching? Yeah. Um, so, obviously, we've both met. You know, I don't want to go into too many details, but the the case that's kind of made us think about this today is it's not that far from me. It's the next city north of us here. Um, it occurred in Nottingham, and it's a couple of instructors who have been found guilty um, of basically child sex offences. And this is something we've talked about a lot in martial arts. You know, I've got in, there were instructors that I trained with when I was a kid who have, it's turned out years later have been found guilty. And there seems to be, I'm going to say, far too much of it. Obviously, any is too much, but there's so much of it in martial arts. And the thing that people don't tend to realize is just the lack of regulation that there is in martial arts. The comparison I've made before, and it's one we, we've discussed, like we've got mutual friends who work with kids, uh, working like kindergarten, nursery, people like Courtney, uh, my ex-wife used to work in a nursery. And when you see what they have to do, they have to do the enhanced DBS checks, which is... Um, uh, before you used to just have to do that test and it lasted a few years. Now, when you do that check, you have to update it regularly. And if it's not updated online, you, you the nursery will get closed immediately. And, you know, that's checking for like, you know, a uh, criminal record and that kind of thing. Uh, but then you have to do, uh, you have to have qualifications for working with children. You have to have first aid. You have Ofsted coming in who like oversee education and coming in and, and rating your place. You have, um ratios of how many kids to how many person um all these kind of things occur when you send your child to a kindergarten to a nursery and the most dangerous thing they're going to do is be cutting stuff with safety scissors right and then a martial arts club you're sending your kids to somewhere um to like a community center or like sitting you know, like a, a, a town hall and often there is absolutely no regulation whatsoever and that is to me, that's just absolute insanity. Like, how can you be protecting children in so many different areas? And then when it comes to something like martial arts, there just doesn't seem to be any checks. Now, I, I don't I don't train children at all. Um, I don't have any kids. I don't teach them personally. I don't know if you guys have experience with, um, well, not only with your own kids, but also uh, taking your kids to other sports and things like that and taking them to places and seeing um like what regulations are involved in other sports because in martial arts there is nothing i guess i'll jump in because my kids mixed kids are older mine are i got two five-year-olds and a one-year-old uh five-year-old twin daughters and a one-year-old son and it's interesting to me that despite growing up in martial art albeit non-traditional martial art not like in your classic uh karate taekwondo federations but growing up around it very much and now it's my whole life Despite having children and despite occasionally teaching kids, Nathan, when you brought up this topic and the lack of regulatory bodies in martial art, that had never even occurred to me. Not only is it infrequent, you know what I mean, um, but it, it, it's not even part of the conversation. And immediately when you said it, different pieces started to fall into place in my head of uh, the inevitability, maybe that's maybe too bold of a word of some of these scenarios to happen because when we look at uh, similar institutions, whether it's um, education, you know, like public education, that kind of thing, uh, the church is an obvious uh, comparison or whatever, um, where anybody who has a tendency towards predatory behavior is going to seek out the easiest opportunity to be given access to those people that they might prey upon, right? And if martial art is an example where you can be an adult with, with, by the way, a high level of authority in the room, not just the authority by default of being a, 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 an adult or an educator, but you know, you have a fan, you might be called master for crying out loud in that, in that space, right? There's a huge gap there, right? It's surprising to me that 
it's it seems so unchecked yeah that's as you say something there see in my head i always thought about like the individual yeah like the dangerous individual who sets up a club who's a predator and does it within their club and that kind of thing um but then when you were just talking there, I was thinking about, yeah, organizations and people with power, like you've seen it in American gymnastics, you've seen it in football, you've seen it in so many other things. Once you give somebody the power, then it can happen as well. So, I mean, what it comes down to is what we call, I don't know if they call it safeguarding in America, but that's what they call it here. Uh, and safeguarding is about creating a safe environment. Uh, and this can be for vulnerable adults and it could be for children. Um, and it's about having policies in place, procedures in place, um, uh, training in place, um, and ed educating your staff so that everybody knows what, like, what behaviors you should do and not do around children or around vulnerable adults. And if there is an issue, how that should be raised and how that should be processed. Um, and then you should have like uh, monitoring and implementation to keep that stuff going. So I know there is there, there are guidelines on for safeguarding from Sport England, who obviously a lot of sports here, and you can get a thing called Club Mark, I think, and uh, you can there is like a something you can do for uh, like a safeguarding badge to have for your gym. Um, I and mean, I've literally never seen one that's got it, but I think that is a thing over here. Yeah, I think there's, I'm sure there's similar things here. Um, even if only for commercial purposes, I have to imagine somebody has come up with that idea to try to offer some sort of emblem, some sort of sticker, some sort of grading as it were. Um, but I think it's important to, like, I guess I'd be curious to get your guys' feedback for us to sort of paint a picture for anybody who's involved in martial art who's saying, well, that's not always the case or not my school or whatever. Because I think we run the risk of, in a lot of these traditional programs where you have adults and children, perhaps in the same class, uh, training together in the same space at the same time, where the teacher could be a saint, you know what I mean? The, the, the actual people in um, the, the powerful position, as it were, could be great, but there's still other power dynamics in the room. If, if for nothing else than the fact that literally you're wearing a sign of stature, you, you have a colored belt that suggests, right? So the entire environment is broken up into very specific power dynamics and people are being put above one another for a variety of reasons. And when we stop for a moment and consider, could that result in this sort of negative behavior? And then we look at other examples, be it uh, American gymnastics, be it wrestling, be it the church, we had to confirm that, yes, absolutely, it could be possible. And I guess it's, for me, I, having never realized this before, I'm curious to kind of hear more opinions from you guys on um, why we should be conscious of this as teachers or as school owners, and maybe just things to look out for uh, when we're perhaps mixing adults, kids, and like you said, at-risk uh, people in general, right? But I've seen the behaviours that lead to this. There'd always be a brown belt and a black belt, and as soon as you know, some hot white chick, uh, white white belt chick came in, that bit, she'd be dating him within maybe three months. And I'd seen it, but then because I'd moved away from that sort of training, I never realised it. Now, Kurt, a mutual friend of ours was the person that made me realise and highlight it. And uh, again, it, to, to steer the conversation to less unsavory, but still quite unsavory things, uh, is where you're talking about the power dynamic. Diana Rathborn, our dear friend and teacher, wrote a great article once, basically how to identify, and I think the term was, how to identify and get rid of the lizards in your gym. And it was basically because she was normally the one woman in the class for such a long time. So when new girls would come in, she'd be like, well, I'm already in here now. So I know what these guys are like. And she was able to literally, I swear to God, she profiled. Like I said to her, I said, you need to get a job at Quantico because every single one of the five guys that you've mentioned, I know one type of those guys. And again, like so we're steering it off you know, what, what I would say, not illegal, but just inappropriate behaviour, you know? And I, like, uh, yeah, I think that's more for me what I see where the problem is, because where you were saying, Kurt, where you go, well, I don't know, is it is it this huge thing? Um, it may be not a huge thing, but the, the ripples of the, the ripples come through 
And we've seen that so many times in martial arts. And, it, you know, I'd like to know your take on it, guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you clarified that because, one, I, I don't want to imply that, that there's some, I'm not trying to build out some conspiracy theory that there's some horrible thing going on below the surface. Uh, but just that it has recently now occurred to me that this is the sort of landscape where that kind of stuff happens, that kind of predatory behavior. But you're absolutely right. We need to take one step further back and realize, you know, predatory might be too uh, controversial a word, but there is in that power dynamic, absolutely um, some, we all know that guy at the gym is another way to put it, right? Whether it's the gym you lift weights at, or it's your MMA gym or whatever, we've all been around that guy who you're absolutely right. Somebody attractive comes to the door, they're right on them every time, every time, every time. And so very often the consideration to uh, deter that behavior is a commercial one, right? You're going to scare away these potential students and customers. And that's an important consideration if you have a commercial enterprise. Um, but there's also just inherent in that, the idea that that dude or that person is not always a guy, but that person is always out there. And how do we remain kind of mindful or, or vigilant about that? I, certainly Diana's uh, article is a great reference. Nathan, what do I guess I'm just curious since you're the first person that really brought it up to me. Um, I just love to hear you speak more on it. Yeah. I mean, when you guys were talking about power dynamics, it was making me think, you know, see, it makes you think of cults. It makes you think of religious groups. And then you see the comparisons with especially traditional martial arts groups when they have a, well, supposedly charismatic leader, usually not, but um, some guy, but all everyone looks up to them. Um, and I mean, in the case that we kind of jumped off from and I've seen it before as well, it essentially can be, there can be some grooming. Like there can be, I mean, when you see someone, an adult teaching and then they end up teaching and dating someone who was on their kid's class originally, which seems to have been the case with um, the, the case we were talking about earlier. Like that's obviously ne another level, but you also see it with instructors just kind of giving someone a bit of extra attention and uh, yeah, flirting with them a little bit. And obviously if people look to the instructor in the room, you know, I mean, we've all probably had it, you know, people, you know, a woman comes into the gym and immediately makes a beeline for a, a senior student or an instructor um, in the same way that guys often, if someone comes in, they go for them. Those kind of dynamics within a gym are really, really difficult like i've me and my, my gym manager carl we discuss this stuff all the time there's often something or you know someone will be in the gym and we can start to see something starting to happen um and obviously we as, as guys we need to call out other guys if we see another guy behaving inappropriately we need to say something like that's uh, i find it harder to say something to women who are acting inappropriately um you know we we have had to have those conversations with people but yeah, like if it's adults they're adults they should be allowed to kind of do things that's why people that's what people meet people doing stuff but also again if there's a power dynamic that that becomes an issue um you know i was like I said there's a lot to learn from other organizations but has anybody got this right as workplaces got this right with the hr departments is you know religion got this right like no one seems to have gotten gotten it right like how do we protect people and create a good environment and create a good atmosphere in our place and protect the people that are there i mean that's what we're trying to do we, you know we talk about self-protection i mean geez like we're trying to help these people one thing that that we did reference and that certainly does exist is regulation like regulating bodies um i'm most familiar with some of the federations around uh traditional karate or taekwondo in the states and certainly there's bjj ones as well um but the really big commercial enterprises the sort of suburban karate enterprises that are at times like uh, daycare, you know, childcare programs to a degree. I mean, they literally have buses that pick kids up from school. I don't know if they do that there, but they literally have their own bus that picks the kids up from school, brings them to their karate school, to the dojo. They feed them food. They do all this kind of stuff. And I'm unaware, it may exist, and somebody listening can could point it out, um, but of a lot of checks and balances in those as much as it is really at the end of the day, a commercial enterprise. And so when you're talking about, um, you know, 
if if there's a bad seed in that organization, you know, they might want to quietly get rid of them. But a lot of the times, a lot of the times it, it's a commercial consideration for them so that they can continue to re remain viable as opposed to that governing body being strictly to ensure the safety and security of the people in that are students in that school, whether they're children or adults. Adults is different because, as you said, Mick, there's the potential for consensual relationships even that are naturally organically growing by two adults that are voluntarily training together on the mat. That kind of stuff happens. But the fact is that that stuff can happen and that's great. So what um, examples do you guys have of organizations that are maybe regulatory or uh, martial art programs that have done a good job? And what are examples that we could cite for uh, maybe for a parent to try to keep an eye out for, hey, this is good, good checks, good balances to keep in mind? Yes. I mean, it was supposed to say good things, but I'm not sure we'll get to you. But when you just mentioned uh, like buses picking up kids and stuff, I mean, the one combat sports instructor who created a massive big organization and became incredibly famous and was picking up kids from you know disadvantaged areas and bringing them to his gym and that kind of thing you know two of his main students were um committed a sexual assault and it turned out that he'd committed a sexual assault when he was a teenager as well so like yeah um i'm sure mick knows who i'm talking about um, yeah so it, i mean it's proof that that if nothing else, those things do happen, right? I, yeah. Obviously, you, I, we're not saying that every organization is doing something terrible, but to the parent who's thinking, well, yeah, I guess I will, there's a lot of these, you know, vans. Well, sometimes it's as bad as yeah. it sounds. No, no, I, I was going to get onto what you were saying there, but it just made me think like there's just so much of this. Um, but yeah, we'll do, we can talk about possible like ideas for courses and qualifications that people should have. Um, you mentioned parents. It's, it's a difficult. All of this is a very thorny subject, and you never want to be like, you know, blaming the parents or anything like that. But precaution is a good thing, and I think parents should ask questions. And if an instructor has, um, like over here, an enhanced, enhanced DBS, uh, which is the journal of the check, so they're okay to work with children, and they've got a first aid, and they've got insurance, they should be absolutely fine showing you those things. They should be happy to do it, to make you feel safe, and to show that they've gone the, the extra step to do all that. If the person doesn't want to show you that and gets annoyed, run. Like, you know, and, um, but also, but ask, like the, I, I don't train children. There was no one under 16 allowed in my gym. And I still get parents messaging me all the time just saying, how much is it? Can I just drop my kids off? Never asking any details for anything, what I teach on the classes, anything, unless occasionally it's someone being like, I want my kid to be a pro MMA fighter when he's older. And they want to, like, I have people phoning me up saying, oh, can I have my five year old come down and do MMA? Like they've got no idea what it would entail. They've got no interest. They just want to drop their kid off. They think they want their kid to be a badass. And I'm just like, it, the mind boggles. Like, wh like, what do you, you're just dropping your kid off with a stranger to do fighting in a random place. Um, but yeah, but, but, you know, ask questions, uh, talk to these coaches, um, try a few places out as well. Like that's always a big one for me. Like I always say, go around. Cause you know what? Like everyone always goes to the closest place or the place where they know someone already goes. But if you don't get a good vibe off that, go somewhere else. Like just, you don't have to stick there. And, you know, and if there's ever an issue, speak up. Again, if a legitimate place is training children and they have safeguarding in place, they have a procedure to deal with this. If they don't, go and find somewhere that does. So I'll give you an idea. Right, right now, I can show you my phone. So I've literally had a message come through while we're doing this podcast. So I get parents and they're like, is it direct debit or can I pay by the class? I immediately know that woman is literally going to drop her husband and the kid off. And that's it. What are some uh, programs or even hypothetical programs? You know, if you guys know of ones that are in your, your area that are accessible in the UK or whatever, we can cite those as well. But hypothetical programs that we should have or that we should create or that we should seek out to make sure we're checking all of those boxes. As you guys have been talking, I've been taking notes because it's occurring to me in this conversation how important this thing is to me. Uh, so I'd love for us to maybe build a list for somebody else like me who's listening and for me as well. I've got three children, right? All three of them are teachers or my youngest son works in academia. Every single one of them is like, as they say, when it comes to safeguarding, you have no idea now like the checks and balances that have to be done, just even down to silly stuff like 
just don't be in a room alone with the child. Why? Because it's just too much trauma. And that's literally, that is the schools telling them, you don't need to be there. Why would you do that? And it's, it really, really shocked me because when the story broke, as I said, I know these people and I was totally in shock. And then I was like that. And then it made me question everything because I'm like, mm, okay, so they're everywhere there. And, you know, without, as, as Kurt was saying, you don't, you don't want to think that there's this massive conspiracy theory. But at the same time, I look back on behavior that happened about 30 years ago and I'm like, mm, no, no, no. And it was like we were trying to, like, where we're trying to work out, like, we're looking for a roadmap to get out of here. Me personally, all these guys who own these, like, super dojos who are worried about it, do you know what I think they need? They need the thing that they're afraid of most, an outside body coming in and going, right, guess what? You don't get your ass in gear within a week, you're out. Why? And it's like, get four cameras up. How, how much does a GoPro cost now? Get four ring doorbells, mate. Like, it ain't expensive. It's not expensive to do this. Why don't they want to do it? And I don't want to sound like, you know, the end of V for Vendetta here, but, you know, if you're scared of that totalitarian regime that these guys are going to bring in, what are you hiding? Kurt? Well, so you're, you, you touched on a whole bunch of different things, but I think... Uh... Yeah, it's interesting to, to speculate why somebody would have a, a, an issue with that. You know what I mean? Maybe it's for a lot of people, everything is political now, so they don't want to, they're afraid of anything that sounds like quote unquote governing body. But the fact is, there's countless reasons why, um, to your point, to Nathan's point, why, why somebody would want to allow those checks and balances to come in, would want to allow a neutral third party to come in that has no commercial interest uh, outright or has no political interest, whatever that means in this day and age outright. But it's really just about uh, the, ensuring the common sense of what, what safety and security is, should feel like, should look like, et cetera. You threw out a bunch of different examples um, and again, I'm trying to kind of take notes as you guys are saying this, both as a parent, as a martial art teacher, as a martial arts school owner, and as somebody who always has other parents asking me for advice and seeking out martial arts schools. Um, to those that I've given advice to, who I don't know why they'd be listening, but I'm embarrassed to realize in this moment, my advice has always been about styles. Like that's what they're asking. Well, here's why karate is good, but MMA could be good for this reason. Some kids like judo, little dudes wrestle, blah, blah, blah. Probably what they're asking is how do I make sure the school owner is not a scumbag? And then even though I'm a parent, it never occurred to me. And it's, I know it's because I'm a martial artist. I know how to sniff out the weirdos, right? I know if I walk into somebody's school right away, I can tell the vibe, the culture. I can tell the way they're talking to people. You guys are the same way. Anybody who listens to this who's been involved in martial art has that ability. You, you have that that sense. But everybody else is not the, the converted like we are. And so some of the examples you've given so far. Yeah, Nathan, go ahead. So I was just wondering, some of these parents we're talking about, like, and asking where to put their kid, how many of them when they're putting their kid in a school, do every check and move to a new area to get in a catchment and put their kid in that school. And then when they go to put them in a martial arts school, they just put them in the nearest place to them. Like, yeah, like, well, and like, just gotta treat as... it. you gotta go like, if I'm gonna put my kids somewhere that I've you know, I've looked at what the best practices are for doing, you know, the, what I want them to achieve. And I do that with the school. Uh, why wouldn't you do it with their pastimes as well? Like I don't, it, well, it's funny that you're saying this because one of the pieces of advice I've given, it, which is in large part because the way it usually is asked, at least of me, is I want my kid to get into martial art for X, Y, Z benefits, right? Discipline, activity, health, you know, usually discipline is a big one, confidence, anti-bullying, whatever. And so they have concrete reasons. And because they have an objective, one of the big things I say is at the end of the day, it's fair to say whichever place is closest to you is a good place to start because you're more likely to go, right? And if that, that objective really is important, that goal is important for you and your kid, then being realistic with time management being such a factor as a parent, it's good to at least start your sniffing out there. But I do try to always point out as a parent, trust your gut. You know what I mean? If, if you get a weird vibe off the people there, then there's plenty of other options. There's no reason to stick around with a place where you think maybe the teacher's a jerk or you didn't like something he said, go to the next place, forget about it. They're all over the place, you know? Um, 
but you're right. I think in general, the evaluation process is different for any activity. I know right now we're in getting into summer camp mode for my kids to find activities to do to keep them occupied in the summer. And really the consideration is what's out there as opposed to, you know, despite how safety oriented I am as an individual, what's the safest option out there? It's really more like, especially in 2022 with in the COVID era, we're in what's even available anymore. That's really interesting. When you were saying about like what the, the, the goals they're looking for and, you know, the anti-bullying and this kind of thing, I think maybe, and then trusting the good, I think a good point maybe is this piece of advice is don't fall for the advertising so much. Like it might be saying all the stuff that you think, but con men are really good at that for a start, you know. Um, they might be saying all the right things, but when you get in there, if they aren't answering your questions, they aren't doing best practices, if they're trying to bully you into something, if they're not letting you be involved, um, you know, be there and be around your kid and that kind of thing, they, if they want you out of the gym or something, like, you know, go with your gut, go with your gut on that stuff. It doesn't matter what they're, if they've got, 20 kids lined up in a black belt that, that, that doesn't necessarily matter if you don't feel it's right or they're not giving you the answers you want then then walk then walk here one thing that does happen is there's a lot of like um community or neighborhood private groups on facebook or other social media platforms right that are homeowners that are just your, your neighbors or whatever it's, it's kind of a um like it, it would have been a uh Oh, what do they call them back in the day? The the message boards or whatever. And now it's a it's a Facebook group or whatever. So there's those are great resources and those questions get posted there a lot. And if you are a parent, uh, or you could suggest to parents that you know to even just run a search, uh, keyword search within any of those groups. If you've got one that's for your community or whatever, access one or create one for that matter. If if one doesn't exist specifically for checks and balances like this. Definitely Google reviews. Those things are are an excellent point. I just put that on the list. Um, and sadly, we, we also know that there's a lot of terrible things that happen that don't go reported. So a Google review can't be the end all be all. So as parents, there has to be some sense of trusting your intuition, first and foremost, making sure you actually go to that place, right? Talking to the school on the phone is good but go there, right? Actually show up, actually experience uh, what the class dynamic is like, not just on the free intro where they're trying to sell you or whatever, um, but the actual culture of the school on a regular weeknight, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm going to refer here to the list just so we can make sure we, we get it because this is all the stuff you guys are, are talking about. Um, you know, word of mouth recommendations is always thing one. And, but it, it requires that you, uh, I think, follow through on that and make sure that just because you trust your friend and they found something good for their kids, it might still not feel like it's the best fit for you. You had talked before about, you know, a kid's got, uh, I think you said processing issues, right? So if there's kids there that have special needs or whatever, um, it doesn't mean that every school owner is going to be well-equipped or every karate uh, sensei is going to be well-equipped equipped to teach a special needs child, for example, as opposed to a neurotypical child. They might be great with a kid's program, but that's a specific thing. So trying to seek out what feels like a good fit for you and your family. You also mentioned cameras. Surveillance is, not only is it everywhere, and I think more there than it is here, but it's, it's easy to set up. And those are cameras are and should be something that are um, web-based so that you can go access what the camera sees so you can check on your kid, right? And it's not just cameras recording things for the sake of recording it, which as a parent doesn't make me feel very good. It's a camera that allows me to see everything that's going on. They've had these for crying out loud in um, like dog daycare things for a long time. They sure as hell ought to have them for, for where your children go or your loved ones go. Uh, background checks is a great idea. I think maybe Nathan, you had mentioned that some kind of background check, if it's not a, a default thing in the, in the school, you should at least uh, ask about that. And I think if the school or the teacher's pull a funny face over the idea of background checks, then that as a parent would make, or as a martial arts school owner would not make me feel good at all. Um, and the ratio is an interesting point. The, the ratio of adults to children, making sure that that feels like a good balance to you, whether your priority is your kid getting enough attention 
or making sure there's enough just eyes on the room that everybody is safe and looked after in an appropriate, responsible way. Um, and then the last thing, as my wife being a, a child therapist, one of the things she had mentioned to me when I spoke to her about this was not only uh, regulating bodies and, and having the correct licensure or, or stamps of approval, but the need for continuing education relative to this subject, right? So is there a way that uh, these instructors, myself included, can seek out continuing ed to learn how to teach uh, special needs children, to learn how to be safe school owners and create a good culture and a good environment? And if not, can't we, shouldn't we, should we, could we create those programs so other instructors can seek it out? One of the words, as you were talking, that it kept coming to mind is about being proactive, both as a, um, as a parent and as a school owner. I think that's what it comes down to. If you're teaching kids you need to be proactive in what are the finding out what the best practices are and the thing is you know what if you're the leader in doing that in your area surely then that's going to make everybody bring their kids to you if you're the person who goes above and beyond if you're the person who gets the cameras you're the person who goes and learns all the does all the courses on education and, and gets everyone dbs checked like make that your selling point like be proactive so for the guys who are business orientated well that's an aspect of it as well but you should be doing that anyway and hopefully the parents can be proactive with this too too bad that's such a horrible uh, case happened in the news there and uh, you know I, I caught trickles of that story here uh, on, in the states but uh, <laughs> it, at least if nothing else it's given a it's an opportunity to reflect on a subject that's extremely important that in my opinion and experience uh, doesn't probably get touched on enough in the greater martial art community among adults or perhaps even among families um, and I'm grateful for all the perspective that you guys have offered and for kind of cluing me into something that again I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed I hadn't really thought of before and I'm able now to see what my mental blocks were and ways that I can help people in my community find good fits for them. And I, I hope that for anyone listening to this, um, one, that they're okay with what's obviously such a, a thorny, difficult subject, but an important one. Um, and two, that if, if you've not thought of this before, that it gives you some things to think about. Um, I, you guys offered some great answers to a lot of questions, and hopefully this if nothing else, makes people ask better questions, right? And that's maybe the most important thing is ask more and better questions. And when it comes to the safety and well-being of our loved ones, um, there's never enough questions to ask, right? You, you can never ask enough. And so I, I really appreciate the, the information you guys have given to me and to the listeners of the show. Awesome, awesome episode, guys. Thank you.